As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Fire and wind come and do it. Come and feel my 
I love it when the Lord, like, gives me clear direction. And through the years, I've learned to be a little bit more flexible. Because a lot of times I'd be like, oh, it's not God, that's just me, or that's just the enemy coming against me, or whatever it is. But um, when the Lord said to gather on this, this first Sunday of the year, it was just so clear to me. And I'm so excited to be here with you. Um, the enemy's been beating me up all week. I got sick, and so I'd taken the week off to hang out with my family. I hung out, but it wasn't the way I wanted to, right? But I was home and, and uh, got to spend some time with, with uh, my family and stuff. And so, um, but it's, it's, it's New Year's, you know, and last night I was, I was watching the countdown, you know. I was flipping through the different news stations and stuff and just watching the countdown from all over the world and everything. And they're going around asking people, man, what are you going to do this new year? And what are you going to do? What, what, what's your resolution and all that? And, you know, the, the beautiful thing about New Year's is that it brings endless possibilities, right? It's a new start. It's a fresh start. Everybody's like, okay, this is the year I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And what we're going to talk about today is a fresh start. And we're going to talk about it from the perspective of what's keeping you from getting to a fresh start. Because a lot of you this morning have great intentions. I'm going to make a difference in my life this year. I'm going to make a difference in the world this year. But you need to understand that your patterns and habits are what is keeping you back from accomplishing what God has for you. In fact, your habits and your patterns are at the top of the list of passionate things in your life. 
If you think about the things you're passionate about, your habits and patterns lead you to whatever that passion is. I shared this quote with you uh, sometime back, sometime last year, or actually two years ago, and I don't know who said this, but they said, successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. Successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. That means in every area of their life, whether it be a spiritual, financial, physical, relational, whatever it is, successful people do it consistently in order for them to have success. Jesus, I mean, when you read the Gospels, Jesus was constantly on the move. He was constantly in demand. No matter where he went, the crowds just, they just poured over him. Yet Jesus, you never saw one time where Jesus said, I don't have time to pray. No, Jesus made time to pray. It says in the Gospels that he regularly escaped the crowds. Now, he sometimes had to go pray when it was inconvenient. There was times when he would say that he would leave late at night and go pray. When the disciples are sleeping, Jesus is praying. Jesus had a consistent habit of praying. Paul, the, the, the book of Acts tells us that Paul had a habit or custom of going to the temple and sharing the good news of Jesus with those who needed to know. So he had a habit or custom. It was something that he consistently did. The president of Franklin Covey, I don't know if you ever heard of Franklin Covey, but if you ever were in Amway, Franklin Covey was the planner. You had to have a Franklin Covey planner so you could plan out every minute of your day. Well, the president, Sean Covey, of this company, he says something interesting, and you need to grasp this. He says, our habits will make us or break us. We become what we repeatedly do. So your habits will make you or break you, and you're going to become repeatedly what you do. Think about that. Think about that. What are the things that you are continually doing that's either making you or breaking you? The title of today's message is Passions and Habits, The Hidden Truth. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you this morning, <clears throat> and we thank you for this new year. We thank you for this new day. And Lord, I thank you for this message, Lord, this reminder to me um, that my habits matter. They matter to you. They matter in Scripture. And so I ask God through your Holy Spirit that you would guide us and teach us today that we would truly have eyes to see and ears to hear that which you have for us. Speak to us, God. Speak to the very depths of our hearts this morning. I ask this humbly now, in Jesus' name, and all the church said, this is, this is perfect timing, this message is perfect timing for a lot of you. I know it was for me. Many of you have made New Year's resolutions. I guarantee you have. In the back of your mind, you said, this year I'm going to do this differently, and this year I'm going to do that differently. Let me give you a statistic that's going to startle you. 92% of what you said you were going to do or change will not last. So if you wrote down 10 things that you were going to change in your life, nine of them you're not going to do. You're not going to do. You're not going to do. I want to start in Romans chapter 7. I'm going to read a couple of different passages of Scripture from this chapter to kind of get a basis for where we're going to go. Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 15, says this, I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Verse 18 says, I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Verse 24, oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God, the answer is Jesus Christ our Lord. So Paul writes this. Now, a lot of people use this as the excuse chapter. 
Well, look what Paul said. He said, hey, I do the things I don't want to do, and the things I don't want to do, I do. Yeah, Paul isn't, this is what, you're missing what Paul's saying here. He's saying, I get the battle you're in with the, uh, the flesh and the spirit. I understand it. I understand it. I understand what you're going through because I go through the same things. I make mistakes. I do things I shouldn't do. I say things I shouldn't say. But what he's saying is he's, he's taking it and he's making the sin nature or taking the sin nature where it needs to go. He says, oh, what a miserable person I am. We're all miserable this morning, church. But here's the thing. It's through Jesus that we get right. Paul's not making an excuse. Stop making excuses for your anger. Stop making excuses for your attitude. Stop making excuses for what you do. There is no excuse for it. Paul isn't excusing anything. He's explaining the nature of a human being. But then he brings it into into perspective. He says, thank God the answer is Jesus Christ our Lord. Listen, some of you said, I'm going to stop eating junk food. I'm done eating junk food. I'm done with it. I ate so much chocolate, I can't even, I, I look like a chocolate, right? Some of you said, I'm going to stop procrastinating. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start getting things done and stop putting things off. Some of you said, I'm going to stop overspending at Target. I don't know what you said, but here's the thing. We say a lot of things. We want to change, but we don't. In fact, we generally fail. Why? Why do we fail? Well, there's three reasons that I want to attack this, this morning on why we do not succeed. Three of them. The first one is this. We focus on the what, but don't understand the how. So you're focusing on the what, but you don't understand the how. Listen, most of us have similar goals, right? But we have vastly different results. Think about that. You have the same goals as other people, but the results are different. I want to be healthy, right? So mama bear's not feeding me and I'm dropping weight and, you know, (laughs) starving, right? She's looking at, she's not happy with that one right there. So (laughs) guys have to shield me. (laughs) No, she's feeding me. Actually, I eat good. But I had to change how I was eating, right? Some of you might be wanting to be financially free, but you're not doing the things to get financially free. Some of you want to enjoy a a, a deeper relationship with God, but you're not doing the things to get there. You want to make a difference. You want to to have a better relationship with with everybody, right? We, We all have similar goals but we have vastly different results. Author James Clear, he said this, winners and losers, successful people and unsuccessful people have the same goals. They do, right? If you're the person who wants to lose weight this morning and there's might be four or five of you in here, there's going to be vastly different outcomes for you because of how you approach it. Winners and losers, People who are successful and unsuccessful, they start with the same goals. Think of a sports team, right? Every sports team wants to win a championship. That's what their goal is, to win a championship, right? The coach doesn't come in and say, you know what, guys, if we take last in the division this year, it's okay, you know, no. It's about winning and losing. No, they come in with the same mindset of winning a championship, but only one team wins. Why? We're going to get into that. Or if you're married... You don't say, man, I, I'm, I'm going to have a great marriage. I'm going to stay married five or maybe even seven years and then get divorced. That's not what you say. You say, no, I'm in it to win it. Here's what you need to understand. Goals don't determine success. Systems determine success. Systems do. I like what James Clear said in one of his books, called Atomic Habits. Read it. It's it's hilarious, but it's a lot of good stuff in there. He says, you don't rise to the level of your goals. You fall to the level of your systems. You don't rise to the level of your goals. If your goals are here, but your systems are here, you're never going to reach your goals. You're only going to go as far as the level of your system. 
Take, for instance, Daniel. Now, I consider Daniel to be one of the most infamous men of faith in the Bible. We always think about Abraham as the man of faith or Moses, but I think Daniel is one of the most incredible examples of what faith is about. Why was Daniel successful? Why was he successful? Why was it he stood out? Out of the thousands and thousands of Hebrews that were taken into captivity in Babylon, why was it him and his, his three Hebrew uh, brethren that stood up head and shoulders above everybody else? Why was it when David was in the lion's den, facing persecution for being a man of faith, why was it he could be in the lion's den and had the faith to believe that he was going to be saved, that God had him? I'm going to tell you why. It's because he had a system in place that led to a life of faith and faithfulness. What was his system, you ask? Let me tell you what it is. For years and years and years and years, Daniel had predecided that three times a day, every single day, he was going to stop whatever he was doing and spend time with God. The book of Daniel tells us that Daniel morning, noon, and night, would go to the window that faced Jerusalem, and he would open up the window, and then he would get on his knees, and then he would begin to pray to his God, and then he would ask God for favor. Church, his system produced a life of faith, but more importantly, it prepared him for the difficulties that he was going to encounter. Church, you need to understand, if you want to grow in faith, and if you want to be more faithful, you will not rise to the level of your goals of being faithful, but you will rather fall to the level of the system that you're using to attain your faith. Now, here's the mistake that we tend to make. We tend to think that I, I need to change the results. I, I want to change the results. For instance, the result is the end result. So if you want to lose, let's say, 20 pounds before Easter now, right? Or get more organized or pay off your credit card because you've had it so long and been in debt so long, it's like a pet to you, you know? You just, it's, it's everywhere, right? You need to understand it's not the result that you need to focus on. You need to change the systems that cause those results. Change the system. Change the system. In other words, fix what we do. Fix what you're doing. Change what you're doing, right? And the outcome will fix itself. That's the key. We need to change our system. Number two, we don't see progress fast enough. This is the one that gets everybody. I walked on the treadmill, treadmill three times this week, and I gained two pounds, right? Or I read the Bible app. <coughs> I read it all week. I was faithful, and yet I got into the car this morning. I yelled at my kids and my wife on the way to church, and I gave somebody a, a, a finger, right? Yeah. Or you know what? I decided I'm not going to buy coffee anymore, and I saved $100, but yet I'm $37,000. $500 in debt, and that $100 just brought me down to $37,400. So you gained weight, you yelled at your kids, you didn't make a dent in any of your debt, and you think, man, things are not happening fast enough for me. And so here's the problem. We wrongly conclude that small good decisions don't matter that much. We wrongly conclude that small good decisions don't matter doesn't really matter. I mean, really. Like, think of the other side, okay? So, you're trying to do all the right things. But on the other side, maybe you're that husband or, or boyfriend that, that plays video games for three hours. Every day, three hours straight. And you know your wife's not happy, but your mindset is, well, at least she isn't leaving, right? Or you skip church one weekend, and it doesn't seem to matter, right? Your world didn't fall apart. No big deal. Or you ate, you ate a half a box of chocolates the other day. But you can't really tell. I mean, I still look almost the same. Well, here's the problem with that. 
you wrongly conclude that small bad decisions don't matter that much. So you have a conflict. We get trapped into thinking that small good decisions don't really matter, they don't really move the needle, and that small bad decisions don't really matter. But you're missing the truth of what's impacting your life in a massive way. And here's what you need to understand. Our life is the sum total of all the small decisions that we make. Did you catch that? Your life and my life is the sum total of all the small decisions we make, good or bad. Who you are today is a result of every single small decision that you've made along the way. They all matter, and they all add up over time. Now, small decisions, right, small bad decisions, they rarely wreck your life all at once, right? Like, you can make a bad decision today, a small one, and it's not going to completely derail your day or your life. But you need to understand something. Over time, they add up. They start compounding, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. You compromise a little bit here. You fudge here. You cut a corner here. Ooh, that drives me crazy. Just do the job right the first time so you don't have to go back and do it multiple times. I can always tell people who rush through things because then they got to keep coming back and redoing stuff. And it's like, do it right the first time. If you had a business, like my brother-in-laws, they were, they were all contractors and carpenters, and their work was is unbelievable. And they would make sure that everything lined up perfectly. And it might take a little bit longer to get it done, but they made more money than everybody else around them. Why? Because they didn't have to send people back out to fix it. Church, little things matter. And when you cut corners, when you compromise here, compromise there, one day you wake up and you ask, how in the world did my life get so screwed up? How in the world did I ever get in this position? It's because small bad decisions matter. Conversely, if you look at someone who's crushing it, I mean, that person is just crushing in life. Man, they have got it all together. Everything's working in their favor. And yes, they might have some setbacks, but they keep moving forward, right? They are living the end result of what you want. And you look at that and you think, well, how'd they get there? Well, let me tell you right now, they didn't get there all at once. Again, it was one small decision at a time, a moment of sacrifice. It was a small discipline done again and again and again. And nobody else knows about the time you spent in prayer, the time that you fasted, the time that you sought after God, the time that you had a difficult conversation with somebody, the early mornings and the late nights, the grind and the faithfulness that you had, all the perseverance that it took for you to get on a certain point. They don't see that. They don't understand that. But you, you realize it was one small faithful decision after another, over and over and over and over, over a period of years that yet led you to the place that everybody else wants to be. You need to understand something this morning, church. Your hard work, your disciplines, your sacrifices, your faithfulness, all these things are not being wasted. In fact, they're being stored up. They're being stored up for that moment when everything's going to come together in your life and suddenly you're going to be at a level you've never been at. It's like if you think about hot water, right? What's the difference between really hot water and boiling? One degree. The water doesn't start out boiling. It starts out at 80 degrees or whatever it is and it goes to 140, 205, and 211. And if it stays at 211, it's not boiling. But when it gets to 212, now it's boiling. And you see the bubbles and everything that's there. I mean, listen, that one degree degree difference is the difference between hot and boiling. And some of you right now are at that point. You're just one degree off from being boiling. And then when you boil others uh, over, others are going to see it as an overnight success. But you're going to know, no, I started out like that water. 
I was at 80 degrees, and then I got to 140, and then I got to 205, and then I got to 211. Why? Because I consistently started making small decisions that were the right decisions over time. Church, it's the things that no one sees that bring results everyone wants. It's the things that no one sees that bring results everyone wants. It's the truth. That's the difference maker. <clears throat> My family will tell you I don't sleep that much. I never have. Because I'm always working. I'm always doing things. I'm always thinking. Because why? I, there, it's, I know that if I consistently do these things, the outcome's going to be good. I like what Paul says to the Galatians. Chapter 6, verse 9, I'm reading out of the NIV. It says, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Church, some of you get weary in doing good. You get weary in doing the right thing. Well, there's nothing happening. I don't see any results. I don't see this and I don't see that. But Paul says, listen, don't grow weary. Trust the process. He says, for at the proper time, you will reap a harvest if you don't give up. If you want to lose weight this year, don't give up. Put the system in place and do it. If you want to become financially free, don't give up. Put the system in place and do it. Don't give up. Don't give up. The third thing I want to talk about this morning is our distorted identity sabotages our success. I'll say that again. Our distorted identity sabotages our success. How do you see yourself? How do you see yourself? Because a, a lot of us are really good at faking it and playing Christian and all that kind of stuff, but how do you really deep down see yourself? And do you buy into what the enemy tells you? The enemy likes to tell you that you're nothing, right? And he loves to connect your failures to your identity. You didn't do it right. You're no good at that. You're a miserable person. You did bad, therefore you are bad. Listen, our identity is in Christ. Think about the things that have been said about some of the great people of faith in the Bible. Moses, it was said that he wasn't a good speaker. Gideon was said to have been the weakest. Paul himself said, I'm the least and unworthy. But yet none of that held them back from doing and being what God called them to be. I just have an addictive personality. That's why I just binge watch everything and drink and eat whatever I want. I stink at handling money, so that's why I shop. Right? Right? Well, I mean, it doesn't really matter. I don't handle money well anyway, so I'll just go blow it. I'll just go shop. Or I'm not organized. Or I'm not disciplined. Or I'm not good with people. Church, I want you to grasp this truth this morning. An unhealthy identity creates unwise habits. And unwise habits enforce an unhealthy identity. Did you catch that? An unhealthy identity creates unwise habits. If you have an unhealthy identity, then your habits are going to be bad. And then to reinforce that, if your habits are bad, they're going to reinforce your unhealthy identity. Church, we need to switch how we think. This morning, I want to encourage you to take a different approach this year. Most people create do goals, right? Right? Do goals. I'm going to read more, get more sleep. I'm going to be on social media less, right? Those are do goals. Today, I want to encourage you to start with who goals. Who do you want to become? Who do you want to become? Do you want to be a true man of God? Maybe you want to be a godly wife and mom. Maybe a bold witness. Maybe you want to be 
sober and clean. Maybe you've been addicted to drugs and alcohol. Maybe you want to be financially free and and be generous. Maybe you want to be a healthy person. Listen, identity shapes actions. Identity shakes actions. Shapes, not shakes. I remember one time when I was working a job and my uh, boss calls me in and tells me, hey, you need to go around and sign off on all the fire extinguishers for the month. And I'm like, oh, okay, I can do that. You know, no big deal. So it's a huge facility, so I've got quite a f- few places i got to go. And every time I go to sign off on a fire extinguisher, it hasn't been looked at for over a year. So we're out of compliance. So I don't sign off on anything. I, I look at every single one of them, and I go back and say, hey, look, check this out, man. Um, they haven't been signed off on in a year. He goes, oh, well, it's no big deal. Just go back and just go back to the last time it was dated and just date them all up. So I'm like, okay. I turn around, I start to walk away, and I'm actually starting to go do it, and the Holy Spirit grabs me, and he goes, what are you doing? You're a Christian. You belong to me. Not only that, you're a pastor. You can't do this. This is unethical, man. You cannot do this. So I went back and I told him I'm not doing it. He says, you better do it. I'm going to write you up for insubordination. I said, then get your pen out. (laughs) Write me up. Let's see who wins this one. Let's see who wins. You're telling me to go and lie that all these 65 fire extinguishers have been checked on a monthly basis. You want me to lie about that? Write me up. So he did. This is how arrogant this guy was. He writes me up. Sends another one of my peers to go take care of it, and he just willingly goes and does it. Here's the point. I knew my identity. And I knew that my identity would not allow me to do that. See, sometimes we compromise our identity, church. Sometimes we compromise our identity. Here's what you need to understand. When you know who you are, you know what to do. When you know who you are, you know what to do. When people ask me, man, I don't know how, what I should do about this, I always think in the back of my head, who are you? Who are you? What is your identity in? Some things people ask and I go, I don't even know how you asked me that question. But I get it. That's where you're at. When you know who you are, you know what to do. For instance, maybe you want to quit smoking cigarettes. So you go, you know what? I'm going to stop smoking cigarettes, and instead I'm going to start vaping. Right? And you start believing that you're a smoker, right? But you're not a cigarette smoker. You're just, I'm not smoking cigarettes anymore, right? I'm just, I'm just smoking. I'm just, listen, your identity's messed up, man. If you want to quit cigarettes, then you say, no thanks to cigarettes, I'm not a smoker anymore. I don't need to smoke. I don't need vaping. I don't need cigarettes. I don't need nothing, right? Smoking is the former life. That's not who you are. Your identity is in Christ now. Church, what is your identity this morning? I know a lot of you are saying, well, I'm just who I am. It's just who I am. I'm trapped. I'm a sinner that can't change. You know, it's just is what it is. Well, let me remind you of the words of Paul in Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 6. He says, we know that our sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. He says, we are no longer slaves to sin. Right? So, right there, he says, you're no longer a slave to sin. That's why we sang that song. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. You have been set free from the power of sin. Verse 18 says, now you are free from your slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteous living. What is your identity? Is your identity still in the old sinful nature? 
where you're still a slave to sin? Or is it in the identity of being a slave to righteous living? Church, who am I in Christ? Who are you in Christ? Who are we? Church, we're forgiven. We're redeemed. We're the child of God. We're overcomers. That's who we are, church. And we stop, need to stop living this identity that we're, we're anything else. We belong to Jesus. And so, because we belong to Jesus, the identity of Jesus in our life should shape our actions. Healthy identity creates positive habits. Positive habits reinforce a healthy identity. Do you see the difference between the two, between what we read earlier and now this? A healthy identity creates positive habits. If you have a healthy identity of yourself, your habits will reflect that. And then those positive habits are going to reinforce your healthy identity. Church, if we could just grasp this truth this morning, our lives would be so much different. As I was wrapping this thing up, I was thinking about who do I want to become? Who do I really want to become? Right? Like, when I'm in my 70s or 80s, if I live that long, right? They're, they're fast approaching me quickly. What do I want people to say about me? And here's, here's what I came up with. I want them to know me as a guy that loves Jesus, man. I just love Jesus. And I can tell you, and you guys know me sometimes, my actions don't reflect that. But I want to be known as a guy who loves Jesus. I want to be known as a man who adored his wife, who adored her. Sometimes my actions don't speak that. I want to be known as a great dad and pops, a better grandfather. I want to be known as a devoted pastor to this church. I want to be known as a strong leader who believes in people. See, I don't lead from a position of, of lording over you. I lead from a position of believing in you and helping you get where you're supposed to be at and do more and make a difference in the world. That power-tripping leadership does not work in the body of Christ. It always implodes. Sadly to say, that's what's happened with a, a major world church. They have lost all their leaders in the last six months. And it's sad to see that, that the enemy wins. These weren't bad men. They were men who got off track. I want to be known as a wise steward. The guy that takes care of whatever was trusted to him. My family, my influence, my money, my time. That I used it wisely and I used it to the glory of God. And lastly, I want to be known as a dude that's enjoying the ride. I'm just enjoying this ride, and I don't always enjoy it. Sometimes I get stressed out and worked up. But I want to be known as that guy that's enjoying it, man. I want to be known as the guy who's rich in friendships, rich in experiences, rich in generosity, and leaving one heck of a legacy for my family and the body of Christ church, when you know who you are, you know what to do. What is the person that you want to be this morning? What does that person look like? When you define who that person is and what that person looks like, then you have to know what to do. If you want to be a godly man, then you have to know what to do. If you want to have a, a healthy lifestyle, then you need to know what to do. If you want to be wise in what to buy, then you're going to have to know what to do. And you're only going to know what to do when you can define what your identity is and who you want to be. Church, in closing, no single action changes your identity. So don't think that if you just, just one single action is going to change your identity, it's not. It's multiple actions over time. 
multiple actions over time that help you to see the change in yourself. It, it grieves me um, to think of how much we, we waste, how much I waste, how much of my time I waste, how much of my resources I waste. Um, and I realized in this message is because of my identity. As I shared with you guys a couple weeks back, I struggle with my identity in, in God. I struggle with God being able to love me because I know how unlovable I am. And because I don't see my identity in God and in Jesus like it should be, I struggle like you do. I struggle with success. I struggle with uh, consistency. <clears throat> Here's what God showed me this morning. You don't have to be perfect. If you skip a day and eat too much or lose your cool one day or have an impulse purchase and if you have an buy, buy for me if it's impulsive, whatever. <laughs> Listen, you need to understand something. In an election, you get votes from both sides, right? Both sides vote. And you don't need to have a unanimous vote to win, just a majority. So you need to understand you can't be perfect. But if you make a mistake and keep on going, then you're going to begin to compound what you're doing and the end result is good. Like, this is a great example. This isn't my example. I found this on the internet. I love it. But <laughs> if I offered you a million dollars right now, right this moment, 10.56 a.m. in the morning, if I offered you a million dollars right now or a penny that doubles every day for 30 days, which one would you take? You might be tempted to take the $1 million. However, if you did the doubling penny, at the end of 30 days, you would have $5,358,709.12. How is that possible? Well, let me give you an example. Day one, you start out with a penny. By day 10, you, you've got $5.12. What? How am I going to get to $5 million in 30 days when that's all I have? Day 15, I've only got $163. What in the world is going on here? Day 20, I'm at $5,000. I'm not even close to $5 million. Day 25, I'm at $167,000. 25 days in, I'm at $167,000. Most of you would quit by then. I'm never going to make it. It's not until you get to day 28 that all of a sudden you see this big shift. On day 28, you'll have $1,342,177.28. And just two days later, you would have $5,368,000. What is it? $5,368,709.12. Most people would have given up after day 10. But listen, Darren Hardy said this in his book, small, smart choices plus consistency plus time equals a radical difference. See, you just started out with a penny and you just kept doubling your pennies. You just kept using your pennies. Small monetary coins in 30 days produce $5 million dollars. Church, you need to be the exception. You need to be the exception. I'm going to be the exception. That's what you got to say. I'm going to be the exception. I'm not going to follow the world and what others do. I'm going to be the exception. I don't care what my neighbor's doing. I don't care what this, I don't care what this person in the church is doing. I'm going to be the exception. I'm going to do the small things, the, the, the right small things, make the right choices, and in doing so, then I'm going to have success. 
And so if you want to get 100% of your New Year's resolutions completed this year, then you need to change your system, not your goal. Change your system. Don't grow weary. Don't grow weary. Three months from now, you may not be where you want to be at, but I can guarantee you're going to be better off. If you're walking the treadmill three times a week, you're going to be better off. I guarantee you will be. You're going to be healthier. Now, you may not get the results that you want, but you're still going to be healthier. And I guarantee you, if you keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it, eventually you're going to get to the bowling point, and all of a sudden you're going to be like, whoa, look at me. I feel great. I look great. Change your pattern and habits. And when you do, you'll be more successful than you can ever imagine. And you will live a life that will glorify God in ways unimaginable. Father, thank you for this morning and thank you for your love and grace. I ask God that you would just continue to speak to us this year and and just help us, God. I mean, we want to do good. But Lord, there has to be a shift in our mindset. You gave us minds. You gave us the ability to think and to reason. And so I pray, God, that you would just instruct us, Lord, so that the refuge could be what you desire it to be, not some communal place to hang out, but a vibrant place that's alive with us here who have a desire to see lives changed, not just changed in this building, but changed outside this building. That's our mission, God. I thank you for my brothers and sisters. I thank you that they came today, Lord, on such short notice. Bless us, God, and keep us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And all the saints said, amen, amen. amen. So um, I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up. And we're going to take communion. And um, as you feel led, please just come up and grab the bread and grab the, the cup and take communion as you feel led by God, maybe with your spouse or your, your loved ones or a friend or whatever. But think about the goodness of God. That's what this song is, is singing about. It's the goodness of God. The fact that God is good no matter what. And when we're in the middle of a storm, it's hard to see how good God is. I know I struggle with it. And thank the Lord this morning that we can break bread and take the cup. And we can do it without regard of somebody coming in and crashing through our doors and arresting us like our brothers and sisters in China and Pakistan and North Korea, other places of the world. Just thank him this morning. Bring the new year in with your, with your Lord and Savior.
church. Amen, man. Sing of the goodness of God. Amen. Give him a clap this morning, man. God is so good, man. God is so good. Man, I just pray blessings over you today, blessings over you this week, this coming year. I ask that God's face would shine upon you, that his light would fill your heart, that you would be a true difference maker in your home, on your job, in your community, wherever you go, that people will know that you belong to Jesus. And that we will glorify God. 
that we will truly glorify God. I pray this over you in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen.